coming up on this episode of The Folklorist. An explorer's harrowing story of survival in an icy wasteland. A town descends into hysteria when visited by an unknown beast. And two young ladies enchant the world with their mystical photographs. Journey with me now as we explore these fascinating tales on The Folklorist. In 1914, Arctic explorer Ernest Shackleton purchased a 300-ton ship that he planned on sailing to the very bottom of the earth, where he and a team of men planned to do the unthinkable, walk across Antarctica. He named his ship Endurance after his own family motto, by endurance, we conquer. Although Shackleton and his crew never actually stepped foot upon the continent, they had to endure incredible hardships during their epic struggle for survival. When recruiting for this dangerous voyage, Shackleton posted an ad warning applicants of the small wages, bitter cold, constant danger, and doubtful safe return. Yet, there would be honor and recognition in case of success. Shackleton selected 26 men for his crew. Leading the expedition was seasoned Captain Frank Worsley, and Frank Wilde was chosen as second in command. Wilde had made trips to the South Pole previously with Shackleton, and the two were close friends. The group was comprised of sailors, two doctors, several scientists, and a photographer named James Francis Hurley, who would go on to capture some of the most stunning images of Antarctica the world has ever seen. Shackleton hired a skilled carpenter named Harry McNish, who was also known as Chippy, and was considered by some to be quite odd. Despite some apprehensions about Chippy, Worsley eased Shackleton's concerns by insisting that his skills were vital to the expedition's success. There was one unexpected addition to the crew, a stowaway named Pierce Blackborough. Pierce had applied for a job on the ship, but was declined because of his age, so he hid inside a locker on the Endurance until he was discovered by Shackleton on the third day at sea. Shackleton said, Do you know if there's a stowaway available? He's the first to be eaten. They get a lot more meat off you, sir. Ha! Huh introduce him to the cook. In addition to the men aboard, they had sled dogs to help their crossing, and Chippy's cat, Mrs. Chippy. On December 7th, 1914, just two days after they left their final port of call from the island of South Georgia, the Endurance encountered treacherous waters. For the next six weeks, the Endurance would ram through nearly a thousand miles of pack ice. Shackleton claimed it was like a jigsaw puzzle, but one they couldn't seem to solve. Then, on January 18, 1915, just 100 miles from their final destination, the Endurance found herself completely lodged within an icy wasteland, and the journey was halted. For the next eight months, Shackleton appeared optimistic for the sake of his crew. He realized if they could persevere until September, spring would finally arrive and the ship would be free. They had enough supplies to last them several months, but for now, they had a frigid winter ahead of them and it would be compounded by a lingering 24-hour darkness that would shroud the sailors. In order to keep morale high, Shackleton arranged shows that featured impersonations by the crew. He held nightly poker games in which he generously provided chocolate and cigarettes. Chippy even built goalposts out on the ice, and the men played soccer daily. But as the months passed, the ice shifted continuously, increasing pressure on the ship's hull. Chippy chased every leak, trying to anticipate where the next breach would occur, even if it meant that he would have to stand in the freezing water. He could plug the holes, but he couldn't stop the relentless pressure of the ice squeezing the ship's hull. By September of 1915, spring had finally arrived, and the crew was anxious for the Endurance to be released from its frozen prison. Shackleton remained optimistic, even though he knew that his ship was slowly being crushed. Then, on October 27th, a cry rang out into the night. She's going, boys! The 
worst had happened. There was a horrible cracking noise. The men dashed aboard to grab all of their belongings. The hull suddenly caved in. Water gushed into the ship. With nowhere to go, the crew found themselves trapped on sheets of floating ice as they watched the Endurance slowly sink into the depths. The men were now marooned. By December, Shackleton realized their situation was becoming critical. Life on the ice was incredibly difficult, with frostbite and hypothermia a constant threat. Food was in short supply, and the men had to resort to eating seals, penguins, whatever they could find to keep up their strength. Then one night, while the crew was asleep, the ice made a sickening crack. Chippy was thrown into the bone-chilling water. The men rushed to save him, pulling him back onto the ice. After hearing of Chippy's brush with death, Shackleton made a decision to save his men by moving them off the unstable pack ice. He plotted a course northwest and ordered the crew to haul their three lifeboats across the frozen landscape. If they had any chance of surviving, they had to reach open water and sail towards land. After hearing of the plan, Chippy was reluctant. He argued that dragging their boats across the ice would cause irreparable damage to them. Shackleton became enraged at his insubordination and his attempt to incite a mutiny. This tense situation was averted, but Shackleton would never forgive Chippy. The crew began their arduous trek across the frozen abyss, shedding excess weight and carrying only essential provisions. Shackleton even threw his own gold watch onto the ice to set an example. The men struggled to haul the cargo and made limited progress, gaining only a mile and a half per day. They encountered repeated setbacks. Sometimes the lifeboats would go adrift. Other times, splitting ice would create giant crevices that would separate the group. Then, in April of 1916, just as all hope was lost, they spotted land off on the horizon. It was Elephant Island. The men piled into their lifeboats, but their passage to Elephant Island was difficult as they were tossed about by the stormy winds and icy waves. After seven long days and nights, they finally made it ashore, with some of the men just barely alive. Blackborough, the stowaway, was severely frostbitten. The team only had five weeks of rations remaining, but Shackleton felt that he could stretch it to three months by reducing each man's allowance. But more importantly, they couldn't remain on Elephant Island forever. Acting quickly in order to save his men, he assembled a team that would journey by lifeboat to find help. Despite their differences, Chippy was chosen to travel with Shackleton and made modifications to the largest lifeboat to ensure that it was seaworthy. Shackleton, Worsley, Chippy, and three other sailors set out for the treacherous 800-mile crossing to South Georgia Island. They were tossed about in the waves. Freezing water poured in with each swell. The stormy and cruel Antarctic Ocean drenched them from head to toe, depriving them of rest and warmth. For navigation, Worsley relied upon a sextant, which used the position of the sun on the horizon to determine their bearings. You see, navigating in the Antarctic was difficult enough, let alone by this method. Seventeen long days passed, and miraculously, they had arrived on the island. Malnourished and exhausted, they soon realized they had landed on the wrong side of South Georgia. Now they had to venture over the island's unmapped and glacier-draped mountains to reach a whaling port where they could obtain help. They knew this quest was their final hope for survival. It was life or death. With only three days of meager rations, they trekked over the mountains for 36 hours without stopping. They pushed forward, knowing that 28 lives depended on them to be rescued. Finally, as dawn approached on the 37th hour, they glanced upon the whaling camp. Boss, it looks too good to be true. They heard a steam whistle, and as they came around the bend, they saw whaling ships and a steamer spouting smoke. They had made it. They staggered into the whaling camp. Shackleton asked for the station manager, whom he had met two years earlier. Don't you know me? I know your voice. My name is Shackleton. Tell me, is the war over? The war is not over. Back on Elephant Island, many of the men were now frostbitten and suffering from psychological stress. As soon as Shackleton had disappeared, second-in-command Frank Wilde set the men to work, always keeping them occupied to maintain their optimism. Every day, Wilde would have the men pack up their gear and walk to the water's edge, hoping that their ship would come in. Roll up your sleeping bags, boys. The boss may come today. Four long months had passed. 
Then, on August 30th, 1916, one of the men spotted a distant ship smoke on the horizon. It was the fearless captain heading towards them. They were saved! As they approached Elephant Island, Shackleton was anxious. He looked out through his binoculars. They're all there! Even the stowaway Blackborough had survived. At Shackleton's insistence, the badly frostbitten young man was the first to be carried aboard the rescue ship. It had been two long years. They had lost their ship. They were marooned on an island. But now, the crew of the Endurance was going home. When they finally returned to England, they received a hero's welcome. Many would go on to tell the tale of their harrowing ordeal and their unbelievable escape from death. Shackleton began his voyage with visions of fame and glory, wanting to be the first to lead an expedition across Antarctica on foot. Instead, he'll be remembered for his unselfish acts of bravery and valor, saving the lives of all of his men, despite the peril that shadowed them every step of the way. You know, there's an old saying by a polar explorer that might sum up Shackleton's philosophy best. I'll find a way, or I'll make one. Is there some folklore in your town? Well, let us know about it. Send us an email, folklorist at newtv.org. We'd love to hear about it. Did you know after making a dash to the North Pole in 1909, American explorer Robert Peary lay in an abandoned camp high in the Arctic, suffering from frostbite? There, he made a commitment to never give up. On the wall of his hut, he carved his enduring mantra, the Latin phrase, invenium vium ot facium, I shall find a way or make one. Throughout the centuries, tales of mysterious creatures of the deep have captivated the minds of countless people all over the world. Stories of Greek gods that prowl a watery hell, giant whales that ingest human flesh, and colossal squids that sink ships have ingrained a deep respect and fear within humans for these creatures of the sea. It was the year 1817 in the New England coastal fishing village of Gloucester, Massachusetts, where a series of strange sightings provoked a fearful outcry from residents who quickly realized that the harbor may be inhabited by a sea serpent. The hysteria began on August 6th, when two women were walking along the shoreline. They looked out towards the horizon and glimpsed an enormous figure swimming in the harbor. But this was no ordinary animal. It was a hideous, scaly, serpentine-like creature, nearly 100 feet in length. They watched it as it slithered under the waves, disappearing from sight. On that very same day, a seasoned captain noticed something while on the bridge of his ship. It was the same dragon-like figure peeking out from the water, and just as quickly as it appeared, the monster propelled itself down into the abyss. Later that day, when he recounted the sighting to his friends, he claimed it was full of joints and resembled a string of buoys on a net. Naturally, they ridiculed the man with hoots and wails of laughter, mocking his unbelievable story. This wasn't the first sighting of a sea serpent in Gloucester. In 1638, a ship passing through the harbor noticed something that laid coiled up like a cable upon the rock at Cape Ann. One settler aboard the boat was about to shoot at it, but was dissuaded by two Indians who said that if he didn't kill it outright, they would all be in danger of their lives. But unlike 1638, these sightings would occur more frequently. Just a few days later, Mrs. Story saw what appeared to be a tree trunk that washed up onto the rocks of a harbor island. What she saw was no tree trunk. Its dark body suddenly started to convulse, startling poor Mrs. Story. But when she regained her composure and gazed out again, the creature was gone. Even her husband claimed to have seen the beast a few days later. The creature moved very rapidly through the water, I should say a mile or two in three minutes. And more evidence surfaced when another resident, William Rowe, reported seeing a figure in the water that same day, claiming its head was as broad as a horse. Within the same week, on August 12th, a visibly shaken shipmaster, Solomon Allen, told some friends that he saw something like the head of a rattlesnake, but nearly as large as the head of a horse. When he moved on the surface of the water, his motion was slow at times, playing in circles, and sometimes moving straight forward. 
Some residents were beginning to get hostile towards this invasive sea demon. On August 14th, a ship carpenter named Matthew Gaffney caught sight of it from a boat and shot at it. He turned towards us immediately after I had fired, uh, and I thought he was coming at us, but he sunk down and he went directly under our boat. Residents were now at a point of hysteria as sea serpent fever swept across the town. Countless people made their way to the shoreline, hoping to catch a glimpse of the prehistoric monster. Even David Humphreys, a former aide to George Washington, visited Gloucester to interview witnesses who informed him that the serpent's features were much like the head of a turtle and larger than any head on any dog, with a 12-inch spear bulging from its skull. During that month of August, similar reports seemed to emerge daily from sailors, merchants, clergymen, people from all walks of life. Regardless of the accounts, the same question continued to arise. What was this beast lurking in the harbor? Was it a misidentification of some type of marine mammal? Or could it have been a dinosaur that survived extinction? Or was it simply a tale that had become more incredible with each retelling? Word had spread quickly, with the reports catching the attention of the Natural History Collective, the Linnaean Society of New England. And after a brief investigation, the Society published a pamphlet declaring that it was an entirely new genus known as Scoliophus atlanticus. They claimed that it was a breakthrough in the field of natural history, and there were even some reputable sources who came out in support of their alleged discovery. But newspapers viewed it as a sensationalized hoax meant to promote the city of Gloucester, and playwrights would ridicule the city with plays like Gloucester Hoax, a dramatic jeu d'esprit in three acts. By the end of the year, there had been 18 documented sightings of the creature, and while sea serpent fever has died down since 1817, there have been reports of denizens of the deep that have occasionally surfaced off the coast of New England. But whether these sightings were of a creature beyond belief, or if they were just a sensationalized interpretation by an excited town, the mystery of the Gloucester Sea Serpent still lingers to this day. There's more to come on The Folklorist. Did you know, in 1801, a French ship was attacked off the coast of Angola by a creature its crew described as a kraken. The epic encounter was captured by artist Pierre Denis de Montfort. Today, maritime folklorists believe that the monstrosity was a gigantic octopus. Disclaimer. With folklore, sometimes the biggest casualty is fact. But please, keep watching. In the English countryside of West Yorkshire, two girls would take a series of incredible photographs that would capture the world's imagination, leading many to believe in the existence of fairies. In the summer of 1917, nine-year-old Frances Griffiths, along with her mother, arrived from South Africa to stay with Uncle Arthur, their Aunt Polly, and her cousin, 16-year-old Elsie Wright, at a village known as Cottingley. The girls became great friends and played together daily in their English garden, but they were continually warned by their parents to stay away from the stream. One day in July, Frances fell in the brook. But as she was being scolded for not listening to her aunt, she proclaimed, I was playing with the fairies. Their mother scoffed in disbelief until Elsie said that she had seen them too. And the girl set out to prove that fairies exist. Elsie asked her father if she could borrow his camera. And the following day, the girls hurried down to the garden. Less than an hour later, they returned, asking him to develop the plates and eager to see what they had captured. As he developed the negatives, he was surprised to see four strange shapes around Francis. At first, he thought they were birds, and then asked, what are these bits of paper in the photograph? They are fairies. Later that summer, Elsie asked if she could borrow her father's camera once again. A bit amused, he agreed. This time, when her father developed the photograph, he was taken aback as the image depicted Elsie playing with a gnome-like fairy. Irritated, Arthur questioned the girls on the matter, but they insisted they had done nothing to deceive him and that the photos were real. As punishment for what he perceived to be a childish prank, he forbade them from using his camera. 
but the parents were baffled by their claims. Elsie and Francis had always been honest and trustworthy, not prone to lying. The parents scoured the area near the stream, trying to find any incriminating evidence of a possible hoax. Yet they couldn't find anything. No scissors, no clippings, and no evidence of trickery. Summer passed and the incident was nearly forgotten until over a year later when Elsie's mother Polly attended a spiritualist meeting. The speaker's talk revolved around fairy life and after the lecture, Polly brought up her daughter's experience to the group. The photographs made their way into the hands of Edward Gardner, a prominent advocate of the supernatural. Gardner took a special interest in the story and quickly sent the images to photographic expert Harold Snelling, who proclaimed the photographs to be authentic. The mysterious images soon came to the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. Upon examining the figures, Sir Arthur was convinced that supernatural fairies existed. And in August of 1920, at Doyle's urging, Gardner traveled to Cottingley to meet with Elsie and her family. He interviewed them extensively and decided that the only way to determine the truth would be if they could produce additional photographs. They even invited Francis back to Cottingley for two weeks. Gardner provided the girls with special cameras and secretly marked plates so he could detect tampering. They waited patiently for the girls to produce more startling images. Unfortunately, it rained for the entire two weeks, making it impossible for Francis and Elsie to capture quality photographs. Early one evening, however, the rain stopped. The girls darted outside, rushing towards the creek. Arthur and his wife sat anxiously. Soon, the girls pranced back into the cottage, pronouncing gleefully that they had captured three more photographs. The plates were immediately sent to Gardner to analyze, and he was astounded by what he saw. One image showed Francis glancing at a leaping fairy. Another had Elsie staring at a fairy that was offering her a flower. The final photograph depicted a group of fairies prancing in the grass. Upon hearing this news, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was elated. His article in the December 1920 edition of the Strand Magazine, which featured the girls' photographs, sold out within days as the story of the Cottingley Fairies quickly spread around the world. Doyle emphasized that children without any photographic experience couldn't possibly deceive the professionals. Soon reporters and tourists swarmed into Cottingley, eager to inquire about the girls and glimpse the stream where the fairies were said to roam. But all of this notoriety embarrassed the girls, and they soon withdrew from the public eye. Enthusiasm about the Cottingley fairies ebbed and flowed over time. In 1945, Edward Gardner published a book that would rekindle interest in the story. And in 1966, a newspaper located Elsie, who said that the fairies might have been figments of my imagination. But finally, in the early 1980s, after being interviewed for the magazine The Unexplained, the women admitted that the photographs had been faked. In her youth, Elsie was a talented artist and would often sketch fairies, tracing drawings from Princess Mary's gift book. Their hoax had been carried out by using paper cutouts made to stand up with hat pins. Elsie maintained that it was clearly a joke from the beginning and had assumed that everyone else would think so too, until things had been taken too far. Yet Francis would insist that even though the pictures were fake, there were still real fairies at Cottingley. Francis even claimed that she took the fifth and final picture herself, which was actually of real fairies. But Elsie said she remembered taking that picture, not Francis, and putting up the cutout fairies seen in the photograph. The two never agreed on the final truth before they passed away, taking the real tale of the Cottingley Fairies with them. But perhaps their greatest hoax was their confession, and they were telling the truth all along. Hi, my name is folklorist Jacob, and I go to Salman Shakhtar Day School. This is a story about Abraham Lincoln. He was born in Kentucky, February 12, 1809. He grew up in a one-room log cabin. In 1842, he married Mary Tom and had four sons. He was elected 16th president on November 6, 1860. During the Civil 
war, he wanted the country to be united, not divided. He freed the slaves. I hope to be a president like him someday. Did you know that romantic poet William Blake allegedly claimed to have witnessed a fairy funeral? One evening in his garden, he had glimpsed a procession of green and gray creatures, no bigger than a grasshopper, bearing a body laid out upon a rose leaf, which they buried with songs and then disappeared. Perseverance against all odds, a mysterious creature from the deep, a fantastic fairy tale that spread across the globe. These are the intriguing stories that are passed on through the generations. We are the folklorists, and this is the new history. Till next time.